So today I'm going to be doing a very different kind of video, which is a review of a video that I saw recently of a woman in England who reverted to Islam. And I wanted to just watch her video and give you some feedback, uh, some of my thoughts and opinions on just her testimony and her story, uh, not to tear her down or anything, but just to explore and look at how she made this decision and why she made this decision. So if that sounds interesting to you, please keep watching and let's see what happened. Salam, hello and welcome to this video. As you can tell by the title, this is going to be about my journey into Islam this year in 2020. I mean, what a crazy year this has been anyway, um, but for me, this has been a complete awakening. I really didn't expect this out of this year, and I know a lot of people watching this who maybe know me or have been following me previous to this and my travels um, may be surprised as well. Um, but for those of you that are new, my name is Ellie Quinn. I am a total travel addict. I've been traveling on and off for the last 10 years. Two years ago, I quit my job in London to travel full time and I run the travel blog, thewanderingquinn.com, which has got loads of information on all of the places that I have visited. And I've also been uploading videos and vlogs from my travels on this YouTube channel as well. But now I do want to talk about something a little bit different and there will be quite a few videos I say going forward um, about Islam because yes, let's just jump into it. I did do my Shahada two days ago here in London. There will be another video on that, that'll be the next video. So if you're not subscribed already, um, then please do. As you will hear about in this video, YouTube has played a huge part for me in learning about Islam, especially because uh, so much of my learning came from lockdown during COVID. So YouTube really has been uh, just like the most amazing place to uh, just get to know other people that have maybe reverted, um, most importantly, for me actually I've watched so many reversion stories <laughs> and just so many informational videos so that's one thing I want to address first she's talking about reverting and I've heard this from other converts to Islam that they call themselves reverts and from my understanding that this is because Muslims believe that everyone is born Muslim but then sometimes people fall away. And I think that this is an important distinction to make with Christianity because a lot of people will try and say like, oh, Christianity and Islam, like they're almost the same thing. They have so many of the same prophets. Muslims believe that the Bible is a holy book as well. But one stark difference is that Christians do not believe that you are born Christian. Well, we believe that we're all born sinful and we are all in need of a savior because of that sin that we cannot save ourselves. We cannot live a perfect life and we need someone who can step into our place and do that on our behalf, which is the purpose of Christ. Just to clarify, Christians do not believe that you are born Christian whereas Muslims believe that everyone is born Muslim and sometimes fall away and need to revert to Islam. So let's keep going. Because I have a platform on here, I love creating content. I want to now create uh, my own content based on my own experiences to hopefully inspire, motivate, just give some people some information um, on what it is like to be a revert from the UK or just a revert in general. So anyway, let's get into the video on yeah my journey into Islam. So I would say up until the very end of last year, I really didn't know anything. You know, I remember being in Cappadocia, I remember being in Mostar, in Bosnia and Indonesia as well and hearing the call of prayer and I do remember loving that sound I mean I, to be fair so many people do really love this the sound of the call of prayer I feel like it really does call people in um, but that was really it of course growing up in the UK I did also face a lot of media headlines a lot of opinions on Muslims a lot of Islamophobia in fact, I one thing that I really remember really vividly was when Subway, the big uh, food chain, 
wanted to start doing or said that they were going to start doing halal meat and it kicked off like in the UK and I do remember thinking which is really really bad you know well, yeah like why do we need to have halal meat and now when I think about that I think that wasn't my uh it was my opinion, but it was my opinion based on just so much that I'd been told. It was my opinion that that was the headline, and I just agreed with the headline. But there were no other headlines saying, this is why we should. And in if that case, I probably would have seen that. And I was a lot younger as well. I hadn't even traveled at this point, I don't think. So I was a lot more uh, naive. But thinking about that now, I just think like, wow, that is really, really terrible. And that is also how a lot of the people here in the UK feel. So definitely not, uh, didn't have anything to do with Islam in my uh, childhood. Um, I was christened when I was younger, but I also went to church when I was younger and a child with my dad. Um, but after that, I never really followed Christianity or never looked into it on my own as I became an adult. This is something else that is really common with people converting to Islam. So I've heard many like Islamic uh, imams and other people say that, oh, Islam is the fastest growing religion and there's lots of Christians converting to Islam. And I think that that is incorrect. To put it bluntly. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, but this is actually due entirely to rising birth rates among Muslims. Muslims have the largest birth rate of any religious group in the world. That is why they are growing in number. And again, referring back to what I was saying before, that if you are born into a Muslim family, you are automatically considered Muslim. Whereas the same is not true in Christian families. Like I have a son and my husband and I are Christians because we've actively made that decision, but my son is not a Christian. He is going to be able to make that decision for himself when he's older. But if someone were to ask, like if they were to come and do a survey or a census in our household and they were to ask how many Christians live here, we would say two not three. And also, in studying the statistics about supposed Christians converting to Islam, by and large, the people who convert to Islam are minimally religious before they convert. Not always, but as a majority, you will not, you will find many more nominal Christians, like she's talking about here, people who, you know, went to church a little bit when they were a kid. They know a few verses, maybe they went on Easter and Christmas, but they would not have called themselves a devout, Bible-believing, born-again Christian. It is very rare for a devout Christian to convert to Islam. So what she's explaining here is very much in line with the statistics that are out there that she is minimally religious, knows a tiny bit about Christianity, but it didn't really take ownership of it. It wasn't really part of her life at any point of any significance. Just wanted to highlight that. So let's keep going. So then I guess really it all really started um, in Pakistan which was last year. I went to Pakistan in October 2019. I have lots of videos from there if you want to watch those. And Pakistan at the time didn't have a huge effect on me Islamically. It had a huge effect on me like travel-wise because I just had the most amazing time there with my friend Tom. Um, we definitely got to experience that really good hospitality. We met some amazing people, but we did go to Faisal Mosque, which is in Islamabad on a Friday evening. Obviously at this time, I didn't even know that Friday was like a holy day in Islam. He said, let's go into the mosque. So I went in one door. They said, you have to go in this door as a woman and we'll go in this door as a man. Now, I thought we would then like meet in the middle because all of the mosques that I'd been to before, um, you know, women were allowed in the domes and you walked around. Um, but I actually got taken up some stairs onto a balcony, which I was very confused about. Obviously, as it turned out, it was prayer time, which I didn't realize. Um, and so that's why I couldn't go into the actual main part of the mosque. 
but I was up on the balcony and very confused because I could see my friend Tom down there and I'm wondering why can't I go down there and you know I'd heard things about Islam with like women not being represented and not equal and I was very much not very happy at the fact that, I couldn't, we, that we were just on this balcony but I didn't quite recognize it was prayer time so my friend did explain to me afterwards and then I kind of and then I understood. I actually had a similar experience, but kind of the inverse. So when I was in college, I went with uh, some students from my school to a mosque in Chicago, and we went at prayer time, I think it was a Friday even, uh, maybe it wasn't a Thursday or a Friday possibly, but um, everyone was there to pray, and our group was given a place to sit at the back, um, but we were still in the open in the large room, and right next to us was kind of a screened area, and I found out that that's where all the women were sitting because there was a woman who like kind of pulled the curtain ap apart, and she was like, all of the women need to come in here. It's not our way to have women out on the floor. All of the women need to come out here, and I was like kind of shocked and feeling awkward because I was like, they, they told us to sit here, this is where they told us to sit. So I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. They told us to sit here. And so I just remember that like kind of awkward feeling of, uh, I don't, I don't understand the gender roles here. I don't understand like, why is it a big deal that we're sitting back here, like in the open? Like we weren't dressed scandalously. I mean, we weren't covered obviously, but I just remember that woman being so offended that we were sitting out on the floor in the open where all of the men could see us. But I did then get to watch the men pray and that was actually a really, I don't know, I felt so emotional afterwards just seeing everyone pray and I'd never seen anything like that at all before. Um, so I definitely say that was like, uh, just something in my mind clicked then and I was like, wow. But after Pakistan, I definitely knew that I wanted to travel to more Islamic countries. You know, a lot of us travelers, we hear about the really good hospitality in Islamic countries and I love that Pakistan, you know, not many people go. Those are the countries that I love. And actually my list for 2020, my travel list was basically full of Islamic countries. Obviously that's now not happened, but inshallah it will happen next year. But anyway, apart from that, I didn't really have any other interests apart from going to more Islamic countries. But then I went to Saudi Arabia. I got there on the 1st of January this year. And I was very, very nervous about going because of course it's Saudi Arabia. I've heard so many negative things about it, but just like Pakistan, I wanted to go and find out for myself. And I met some really nice people in Saudi. Um, I was there for about two and a half weeks in January. And then I actually went back in uh, February as well to stay with some friends that I'd met. And to be honest, the main thing that really got to me in Saudi and made a huge, huge impression on me was prayer. Because in Saudi Arabia, you know, the shops shut and the cafes shut at prayer time. I definitely got caught out of some cafes a few times, which was a little bit annoying. But once you know the prayer times, then you learn to, uh, to not get caught out. But I just really loved how everything stopped for prayer. And I was also with some people that I'd met there. And, you know, when we then would drive past a mosque, they would say, okay, we need to stop and we're going to go and pray. And up until this point, I myself for the last few years would say that I was quite a spiritual person. I've enjoyed learning about other religions and also just about kind of like the universe and the law of attraction and manifesting and meditating and yoga and all of these things. And I had like my own like prayer practice and meditating practice, um, which I'd done on and off. But it was never something I could really stick to and I didn't like that. I always thought, right, I need to meditate, I need to have that time. But you know, things get in the way or you just make excuses and you, I just didn't do it. So I really loved that there were these five times a day that everything closed and that is when you prayed. And then, you know, the people that I'd met in Saudi just told me how not how good they felt after praying. And I was like, wow, you do this five times a day. Like that is just really, really amazing. So honestly, that was my really main 
kind of eye-opening thing with Islam was prayer. The next biggest, biggest thing for me was going to Medina. Now, I know a lot of people uh, on my channel here actually found me through my Medina video, and I know it also caused a lot of controversy about whether non-Muslims can visit Medina. Now, for me, again, like, when I think about it, I'm like, how did I think that I wanted to go to Medina? Like, where did that thought come from? So when I did know that non-Muslims could go, I researched it, and it is very clear that non-Muslims can go. And I was already going to Jeddah anyway from Riyadh. I managed to find a bus that was a really good price from Jeddah to Medina. I managed to find a hotel, which was a really good price in Medina, which is something that's pretty uncommon in Saudi Arabia because hotel prices there are crazy. Um, and it just basically flowed and then I managed to get a flight back from Medina to, to Riyadh. And for me, like when my life has felt like it's in flow like that and things seem easy, I'm like, this is the right thing to do. If it wasn't the right thing to do, something would have came up and it wouldn't have happened. So I guess now I can say that's all God's plan as well. It was just such an amazing place to visit and it really, 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 really did. Uh, I would say is probably was the main reason that I wanted to leave there and start learning more about Islam because it was just so peaceful. I also learned like a lot about the history. I've also got a video on the like bus tour that I did around Medina, um, like Uhud Mountain and just learning about the stories of the prophets. And then the other thing for me was seeing prayer as well. Witnessing also just hundreds and thousands of people praying at one time, being right next to the mosque was just such an amazing experience for me as well. And so I guess my message to people that think that non-Muslims shouldn't go to Medina is that I don't know if I would have had such an impression of Islam if I hadn't have gone. So in a way that was a huge part of my me becoming a revert. But anyway, after that, I went to India uh, and I run, well this year I started running group tours in India, two week group tours for women, which was really, really amazing. It's something that, um, yeah, I wanted to keep doing, but obviously COVID stopped that, but I do plan to do in the future, inshallah. So um, yeah, I'll leave all the information below if there's anything that if you're interested in traveling with me in the future. Um, and actually this was really interesting as well, because obviously India has, so many Muslims, I think it's the third or second uh, country with the largest pop, uh, Muslim population. But I didn't really know that. I learned a lot about Hinduism in India, Buddhism, Sikhism, but really nothing about Islam. But then when I was, we had a really, really good tour guide in Agra. And we were at Akbar's tomb, which is like an incredible, incredible building. And he said to me and my group, like, do you know what the term Akbar means? And we said, no. And he said, it means the great. He says, that's why Muslims say Allah or Akbar. And I don't know why, but there's just one moment as well, was just another click for me. I think it was maybe just because like, I love India. I love India so, so much. Maybe it was just two things that I'd known about and then coming together. I don't know. But that him just saying that just had such a huge effect on me. And in India, then I downloaded a copy of the Quran on my Kindle. And I also started to learn how to pray, or at least YouTubing how to pray. But then that leads us to March and to COVID. <laughs> so I had to leave India pretty quickly. And I decided to go to Indonesia to the Gili Islands because I'd spent two months there last year. My best friend lives there and yeah, it felt like a much better place to go than to go back home to the UK. Now I do have a video as well of my life in isolation on a tiny, tiny island. Um, I will link that above. But the most amazing thing about that is that it is an Islamic island. So the first place, the first accommodation that I got for my first month, I was literally opposite a mosque. So bearing in mind that just like a week before I'd, you know, started to YouTube like how to pray and then next thing you know, I'm staying next to a mosque and I can hear all five prayers. Now in the end, I was in Indonesia for four months and this is really, really where all of my learning started and all of my learning happened and all of my, just everything because I basically left Indonesia uh, saying like, I'm pretty sure I want to do my Shahada. 
So this was a really, really big step for me. Um, and it very much started from just how to pray. I definitely was not doing it at the right times, wearing the right clothes, not doing what we do, like nothing particularly right. But I guess that's just what you've got to do when you start off. I also just started watching a lot of YouTube videos, mainly kind of just YouTubing like the questions that I wanted answers to, like why don't Muslims eat pork? Why don't Muslims like dogs? Because I'd heard that they, <laughs> Muslims don't like dogs, which is actually incorrect. Um, a lot of videos about uh, hijab and women in Islam. And actually then we were coming up towards Ramadan and I found the Yakin I think that's how you pronounce it, Yakin Institute. I just learned so much from them. They did a like pre-Ramadan series, which was 30 days and they emailed you the video every single day. And so I watched that video every day and I had my notebook and I made notes on every single video to really just remember because I was like that's how I know how I remember is by writing things down um, and the video was very much just about you know our imam and how to keep it high but also just talking about you know it will fluctuate and especially after Ramadan it will go down and that's okay and I think very much the things like that it was just really normalizing it for me and it was also just saying like Muslims are never going to be perfect, like we weren't born perfect, we weren't born angels, um, but just how to navigate that and that really kind of like humanised it for me. But then we got to Ramadan and at first I wasn't sure if I was going too fast because the idea sounded very, very daunting. Um, but at the end of the day I then decided no one is forcing me and I just felt like yeah I really, really want to fast. So even just learning about like iftar and the timings and stuff was all again such a such a learning for me um but i'm so so grateful for it and i didn't fast from water the whole of the month because obviously it was my first time fasting i was also on a tropical island in a lot of heat and it was very very sweaty and hot there as well fasting from food for me was um much easier than I anticipated as well and I also really at this in this month really understood why my Muslim friends had told me that they just love Ramadan so much because I really did have this feeling of peace over me the whole month and the fasting you know on a normal day I think I could not do that but in Ramadan you just do it and I was also learning to Pray, still learning to pray and I said that my goal for Ramadan was to uh, learn to pray basically and to kind of know the prayer as much as possible um, especially al Fatiha, um, which I had all written down and I was reading it then when I was praying and I was using a YouTube video and also throughout Ramadan I read the Quran I basically I, I do like had already got it on my Kindle from earlier in the year and I set myself like a target of well, basically 3% of the Kindle um, every single day, which did take me, you know, two or three hours, sometimes longer, because my distraction is very, it was very easy to get distracted, especially in sections that I just didn't really understand. And finishing it also just felt amazing. I was like, wow, I've literally finished the Quran. Obviously, didn't understand all of it, but I feel like that's not the point. If you understood it all at the first time, then what would be the point in reading it multiple times every year and it's always going to be a different message to you uh, depending on where you are in your life and you so I feel like in listening to her what she's really appreciating about Islam is that it's giving her a structure and a routine and kind of a framework for life that she hasn't had before I mean I'm glad that she it sounds like she really tried to do some research like she was watching videos she was reading the Quran she was trying to learn the prayers so I mean I I commend her diligence but I also don't hear her saying things like she was finding the truth, she was testing things to find out, is this the truth? I hear more of like an emotional connection to the religion, like she liked the places that she visited, she liked how exotic and exciting hearing the prayers was and visiting the mosques and seeing the kind of the social power of hundreds and thousands of people going to pray at the same time. 
but I'm not hearing research done with a critical mind. She's exploring Islam in the sense of she's deciding if she likes it, if it's good for her. She's not choosing Islam because it's right, because it's the truth, because it's it's proven itself to be the true religion. I'm not I'm not hearing a lot of analytical thought. Like she put in a lot of work and that's great. Like I'm glad that she did that, but it's still the framework from which she's looking at it is still a very me focused kind of way rather than is this factual? Is this the truth? Is this right? Understanding of the religion, I guess for um born Muslims and also reverts. So uh, yeah, Islam, um, so Ramadan was, yeah, really, really, really good. Um, yeah, I really did love it. And even though I was uh, very much by myself, I also was just so grateful for the time of lockdown, you know, that I was, didn't really have much to do during the day. I could just read, I could nap, I could get up early and pray. You can kind of speed it up from there. And I know this video is getting really long <laughs> um, because after Ramadan, I yeah, gave myself the goals to keep praying, um, not necessarily five times a day. And I definitely didn't and haven't been doing that, um, but just two or three times a day, um, learning a lot more. I've read a couple of other books. Um, watching some more YouTube videos and also kind of being able to uh, recite uh, the prayer myself. And I kept on doing that until um, when I left Indonesia. So I was in Indonesia, like I said, for four months in total. I left in the middle of July to go back to the UK where I am now. And at the end of my time there, I knew that I wanted to do my Shahada, but I was also very cautious um, and conscious of the fact that in Indonesia I was very much in a bubble. Like I could hear the call of prayer five times a day, like I said, you know, there were Muslims around me. I was a little bit worried, like maybe I'm just in a bubble and, you know, can I take this into my, into my actual life? Like being there, just like many of us in lockdown is not your actual life. Um, but I got back to the UK and I still felt very much the same. I'd ordered myself like a travel prayer mat for when I got home. And I did basically just keep praying a couple of times a day. And I definitely changed my mindset as well very much to uh, as if I was kind of Muslim already, or at least trying to think what would be the right thing to do in this situation. And still learning a lot, still watching YouTube videos and reading books. I read a really good book called Reclaim Your Heart, uh, which also has a huge, huge impact for, on me. After that um, book, I was very, very sure on the fact that I wanted to do my Shahada. And I had a week planned um, in London, which I'm on right now. And I knew that the mosques had started to open up. I then went two days ago to pray for the first time uh, in the mosque with one of my friends, which was, um, yeah, a really nice experience and something that I've been wanting to do for so long. But obviously I couldn't because of COVID. I think there was a lot of things that I couldn't do in the last few months. And I also couldn't kind of had rushed into my Shahada. Like maybe I could have, I could have done it in Indonesia if I really, really wanted to, but I just didn't really feel pulled to do it there at all. Um, and I'm also really glad for that as well, that I really have waited and I've made, um, a decision over a quite a period of time um, and then yeah we went to the mosque the other day that will be in the next video just talking about how that went and also just like a really short kind of clip of my shahada which I'm gonna show you as well and I think that's all I have to say so I have a lot of feelings about this but I think in general, as I said before, what I hear in her her story here is that number one, she didn't come from a strong spiritual background. I mean, she considered herself spiritual, but not really religious. And she knew a surface level amount about various religions, but didn't really dive deeply into any of them. And so this is the first one that she's really diving deeply into and I think she likes the structure. I think she likes the community. She likes 
kind of the atmosphere that it gives her of belonging and feeling part of something bigger than herself. And I think that she she did enough research and found enough people who agreed with the answers that she was hoping to find. I mean, I don't want to put words in her mouth or assume what she's thinking or anything, but I'd really, I'd love to sit down with her and just talk through what she understands because she didn't really give a clear picture like she talks about reading books she talks about watching videos but i don't i don't hear specifics of i had this doubt and this is what i read and studied and this is what the truth of islam actually is that counteracted my doubt or my question i'm not hearing specific i mean maybe she she has things that she would say like she did do that. And also like, I know that the internet is a, <laughs> is a rabbit hole. Like it's very easy if you start searching, like they've done studies on this, that if you type into YouTube or to Google, um, YouTube is owned by Google, so it's almost the same thing. But if you type in into the search bar, white people are, depending on your search history, it'll, it'll bring up different auto, auto fillers. So if you're a person who, you know, watches and researches white supremacy, then your bar will auto fill and will put videos and articles higher for you that are things like white people are the supreme race, white people are more intelligent than minorities. It'll populate things like that versus if you're a person who is often researching racial justice and racial equality, then when you type in white people are, it'll give you videos and auto features like white people are racist or White people don't understand race relations. White people have racial bias. Your, your responses when you go on the internet are going to be different based on what your search history is. So when she went into this, I'm sure that she was asking things like, what do Muslims believe about dogs? What do, why do Muslims wear hijab? And so by and large, the people who are going to be popping up on her feed are going to be the people who are pro those things because there's many more of those than there are of the opposite, um, just because Muslims write about and make videos about what they care about. So my point in all of this is not to tear her down or tear down the work that she really did try to put in, it sounds like. But I think that there is also a, a bias that likely occurred in her research that she, she only listened to Muslims and not to critics of Islam. It's very easy to do that when we are, we're hoping for a certain answer. We're looking for a certain answer. I'm guessing that she probably didn't watch videos very often about like from David Wood or from Sierra International, from Al Fadi, from, I mean, she couldn't listen to Brother Rashid. Like some of those people who are the critics of Islam, who I think she did a very one-sided research and look into Islam. There's also some statistics out there that uh, indicate that for non-Muslim born reverts, that the majority of them leave Islam within just a few years. Once they delve a little bit deeper into the religion and kind of realize what's under the surface, so I don't know if that will happen with her, but I would be very interested to see what is what is the long-term outcome of her reversion to Islam. As a fellow woman from the West, I know that in our way of thinking that we are very focused on our individual wants and needs, our individual beliefs. And so like to her, her decision to become a Muslim is what made sense to her right now. It made her happy and peaceful right now but in the future, within our culture, if she isn't feeling that in the future, if she is not feeling peaceful anymore, or she doesn't feel like it's meeting her needs, the structure is not helpful to her in her life anymore, then it's very common for Westerners to decide, this was good for me in one part, part of my life, but now I've outgrown it. It's outdated, it's, it's no longer, who I am today. It's not what I want for the future. 
I hate to say it, but Westerners often treat life decisions like accessories. Uh, it's good for me today. It looks good today. I like it today, but tomorrow it might change. I think she's a very sweet young lady. I think she did go into this really heartfelt and I am curious to see what happens with her religious beliefs in the future. Uh, I know this was a very different kind of video and if you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing, hitting the notification bell and giving it a thumbs up. And if you have any questions or comments, please let me know down below. And again, thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.